thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak. Today I'll be talking a little bit about um, the project that I had implemented starting in 2017. It's called Head First, a Resident Headache Clinic Initiative. Just foremost, I do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose, and all of the discussions that we'll be talking about today will be FDA-approved indications. So in terms of the objectives, we're going to briefly discuss the role of simulation-based learning in neurology. I'll discuss the needs assessment conducted for the outpatient neurology resident headache clinic. I'll discuss the implementation of the simulation-based learning sessions for on a botulinum toxin A, which is performed in the headache clinic. I'll briefly discuss the preliminary findings of the pilot, and I will discuss some program limitations and further interventions planned to improve the clinic experience for the residents. So just a little bit on simulation-based learning in medical education. There are many studies researching the role of simulation training for physicians and medical students, and many have shown that those who receive simulation-based sessions during medical school or residency exhibit significant improvement in various clinical skills. There are four types of simulations that have been studied, including standardized patient, which actually has a very um, significant wealth of information in the literature, screen-based computers, a partial task simulator, and high-fidelity mannequin simulators. This type of education allows for students to learn and practice in a very safe environment, and especially in these times when we are talking a lot about quality improvement and improving patient safety, it's a really great way to instruct residents and students, especially in procedural skills. Um, Simulation-based education has been used to train residents in advanced cardiac life support, intubation, bronchoscopy, endoscopy, vascular access, amongst others. And besides improving procedural skills, this type of learning can boost confidence in those practicing the procedures, and residents and students do rate this type of education very highly. So I found that a lot of literature was based on the internal medicine realm, and I was looking to see if there was any literature looking at simulation-based training in neurology. And I found one specific study looking at this type of education to improve residents' lumbar puncture skills. And I just wanted to briefly review this as this was one of the inspirations for my particular project. So this particular study compared internal medicine residents who were interns who underwent the simulation-based training in lumbar puncture, and they compared them to neurology residents who were classically trained in the technique of lumbar puncture. The simulation session was three hours and included a viewing of the New England Journal of Medicine video on lumbar puncture, interactive demonstration on a static mannequin, and then practice on the mannequin with directed feedback. And they uh, administered a baseline clinical assessment before the intervention and a skills post-test after the intervention to both groups. And the study had found that the internal medicine residents improved on this exam from a mean score of 46% pre to 95% post, and all of them met a mean passing score at the final post-test. And shockingly, I found that the neurology residents who were traditionally trained only achieved a mean score of 65%, and only 6% of them actually met the mean passing score. And more than half of the residents in neurology could not correctly identify the proper anatomic location for an LP. I was actually surprised by this. And this was something that made me think that utilizing um, mannequins and simulation-based training would be useful for neurology, especially in instructing residents on onobotulinum toxin A injections for chronic migraine specifically. So in terms of the needs assessment, currently the headache medicine education at our institution is primarily lecture-based learning. Residents do have clinical exposure to headache medicine through consults from the emergency department and through the inpatient services. And we do have a resident headache clinic that is subspecialty held on two Tuesday afternoons a month. And the residents do rotate through that periodically, almost similarly to their continuity clinic. And this clinic is reserved mainly for complicated patients or medically refractory patients who have either chronic migraine or other primary headache syndromes. And this is just a chart of the clinical workflow that was prior to the program implementation. So just briefly to look at the workflow, there are usually one or two headache medicine attendings that precept all of the patients. There is one headache medicine fellow, and prior to 2017, this fellow performed all of the Botox injections for patients with chronic migraine. And then the two neurology residents who were rotating, they could be either PGY23 or 4, only saw the follow-up patients, and occasionally if we had new patients, they would see and staff those patients with the attendings. 
residents had frequently reported a desire to learn the techniques of um, injecting on a botulinum toxin A for migraine. And many of our residency graduates actually voiced concern that they did not receive adequate training, if at all, on this technique. And this actually um, gave them a very significant disadvantage clinically because a lot of our neurology graduates um, were practicing general neurology and headache is one of the most common complaints for going to the office to see them. And they felt like they were not able to offer this particular type of treatment for their patients. And in recent years, none of the residents were able to perform these injections prior to graduation. So we administered a pre-intervention resident survey to the current residents, and none of the residents had personally performed these injections prior to residency, and only one had observed another physician perform Botox prior to residency. 90% of the residents had reported interest in learning the injection technique for onobotulinum toxin A. So the purpose of this pilot program was to safely instruct the residents on the proper paradigm for Botox injections for chronic migraine using simulation-based learning, and then assess their procedural skills with a checklist after the intervention. And then the second objective was to improve their uh, perception of headache medicine clinic and their education through this simulation-based learning for chronic migraine. So in terms of the methods, just to briefly discuss the residency, it's comprised of 24 residents, although this coming year will actually increase to 10 residents per year. And they all rotate through the headache clinic periodically. So beginning in July 2017, we held two simulation sessions one was on campus and one was off campus. The headache fellow used a 3D anatomical static mannequin of the head and neck to demonstrate the technique for Botox injections. And the injection technique that we used was based off of the preempt protocol, which was the um, clinical trial that assessed the efficacy of Botox for chronic migraine. The simulation sessions included a didactic discussion of the indications for Botox injections, then an interactive demonstration of the technique on the mannequin, hands-on training for the residents to practice their technique, and then in-person feedback from the fellow. So this is actually a picture of the mannequin. Her name is Camille. She does have, I didn't name her. Um, she has the sensation of actual skin that's very um, similar to what human skin would feel like. So the residents know exactly the depth of injection. They're able to palpate the anatomical landmarks for injection. And there are also specific parts of the mannequin that will go on top of the head to show the exact um, muscular points to be um, used for the injections. And this particular model is available throughout the year for continued practice for the residents. So during clinic, the residents are assigned to see patients who will receive Botox injections, and this is different from 2017, so now the residents will be, will be the primary providers for the uh, chronic migraine patients. And then with direct fellow or attending supervision, the residents administered the injections receiving in-person feedback on technique. And we did have a procedural checklist that we used either by the attending or the fellow to assure that all of the steps were safely uh, performed and accurately performed. And at the end of the year, the plan is to evaluate the residents based on their ability to perform the procedure properly using the checklist. And a post-intervention survey will be administered to all residents at the end of the year just to evaluate their comfort with performing the injections and as well assess their knowledge of the indications for the treatment. This is just a snapshot of the checklist. It just involves four different parts, the pre-procedural timeout, the procedure involving the reconstitution of the Botox, the actual injection protocol, and then post-procedure to make sure that the residents are counseling patients appropriately on post-procedure precautions. So the first year was mainly util utilized as a pilot to assess the actual feasibility of this program. We did have to do a lot of rearranging of clinic scheduling to make sure that we had enough time to instruct the, the residents during clinic itself. And the program is ongoing, so formal results are still pending at the time of this presentation. However, preliminarily, after the first year, 11 residents were able to successfully administer Botox injections with supervision, and one had been able to administer without supervision. And overall, the residents did report improved self-confidence and autonomy in administering the injections, and they rated the headache clinic as a positive learning experience. Now, I didn't mention this previously, but many of the residents had said that they felt that the headache clinic was um, too busy and not educational enough. So this was, to me, was actually really nice to see that they actually felt like this was a positive learning experience. Some of the limitations I do want to discuss about this particular program, the residents rotate through the clinic a variable number of times. So there are some residents who rotate six, seven, eight times through the clinic and others who only rotate twice. So that may affect the likelihood of some of the residents feeling more comfortable with the injections if they've only been exposed to it once or twice. The residents were not studied immediately post the simulation session, um, but rather at the end of each clinic. So again, that may affect their overall scoring at the end of the year depending upon their variable amount of time that they spend in the clinic. 
One of the other limitations that we are currently trying to work on is that the original simulation sessions were considered optional and not mandatory. And unfortunately, because of scheduling conflicts, some of the residents were not able to attend either of them. And so hopefully in the future, the plan is to try to either offer more simulation sessions more frequently, especially throughout the year, or also try to incorporate it into their boot camp education at the beginning of their PGY2 year to make sure that they're all in attendance. And lastly, there is some limited data on the senior residents during year one of implementation, as they may have had some exposure to Botox prior to the um, program's implementation, so that may affect scoring as well. And so just briefly in conclusion, simulation-based learning for onobotulinum toxin A for migraine management seems to be a highly rated positive learning experience for the neurology residents. Um, more of the neurology residents were able to safely and properly administer these injections for chronic migraine on patients in the headache clinic compared to pre-program implementation. And one eventual goal for me is to have program directors consider formally integrating these sessions into a standardized curricula for all neurology residents because I think it's really important to have this skill set um, prior to graduation um, so that they're able to offer this treatment to their patients. I just want to have a special thanks to the Institute for Medical Education for sponsoring my participation in the Harvard Macy program for postgraduate trainees. And these are my references. Uh, thank you very much. I'm open to questions as well. Thank you, everyone. My name is Jen Bellis, um, and I'm going to ta be talking with you guys about a project that I worked on kind of towards the end of my third year of fellowship. It initially had some much larger aspirations, but just due to realities of time and, and feasibility, um, we kind of narrowed it down to, to more of a pilot workshop just to sort of assess some, some feasibility um, in developing a procedural curriculum for pediatric residents. And my mentor um, was Dr. Jenny Sanders um, in the PCR, who's here today. As same with Anna, I don't have any financial disclosures. I don't think I'm actually even going to be discussing any drug use, but if any mention of them will be in accordance with FDA and uh, approved indications. So first we're going to do a little bit of background um, on procedural skill development, um, and then I'll discuss a little bit about the pilot procedures workshop that I did for, res for some pediatric residents towards the end of um, last year. Um, we focused mainly on suturing, so you sort of hear that as the theme throughout, and then uh, discuss the evaluation of those workshops and then next steps um, and, and sort of where, where things could go from here. So a little bit of background, kind of we've sort of discussed this a little bit already with like um, the simulation as well, but similarly, um, to develop any sort of pre procedural skills um, that you need to have repetitive and deliberate practice. So deliberate practice, um, not just repeating something over and over and over again, um, that really for mastery of any skill, you need to have this like focused, goal-oriented practice um, and with immediate feedback. So just kind of doing the same thing over and over again isn't going to give you mastery of these skills. And that's sort of been shown across the board, not just in medical education, but also in mastering any skill, piano playing, riding a bike, driving a car, anything like that. You need some feedback as well. And as in particular for medical education, um, as trainees progress through residency, they're expected to perform these minor procedures with minimal supervision with the goal, kind of similar to Anna's project, um, being that by the end of residency that residents are considered proficient to perform these skills independently. Kind of with that in mind, um, you know, in talking with a number of the pediatric residents um, during my first couple of years of fellowship, there was a wide variation in how people, how comfortable people felt doing um, a lot of these procedures. Um, in particular, again, I sort of started with a focus on suturing. Um, you know, there was some third-year residents who you know, told me they didn't really feel comfortable with this procedure and they hadn't had many opportunities. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit. Of, there's a variety of reasons for that, um, but that, you know, they wouldn't mind having some extra training in that to be feel more comfortable doing it on an actual patient. So the overall goal of the workshop series would be to allow for this frequent focused practice um, of procedures. Um, we, like I said, we initially focused on suturing. The sort of larger goal of the project would have been to include some other procedures as well, including lumbar punctures and splinting and other things, um, and to offer these workshops sort of frequently throughout the year so residents could come multiple times to practice it. If they felt they wanted more practice, they could do more of them. If they were feeling more comfortable or had more experience clinically and they felt like they needed to, didn't need as much, then they didn't necessarily have to come as often. But to have that opportunity available kind of throughout the year. And so, like I said, we initially started with just the suturing curriculum to see, like, is this feasible? Is it something the residents like? Is it something that would be potentially something that could be um, continued on and, and developed and offered more often? So just a little background on kind of what residents currently get, um, or at least as of last year. Some of this has changed a little bit because I know they restructured their training curriculum. But previously, the uh, residents 
particularly suturing, was they had initial workshop at the beginning of intern orientation, and everyone went through that. And then we would actually put on one noon conference per year where we would go over that. Um, attendance at that was often very variable. That has, I think, changed a little bit, because I know last year they were, and Joel could probably mention this, that they restructured how they were doing their resident education for those conferences um, to allow for more residents to be able to participate, because um, many of them would be in clinical responsibilities and not be able to, to come for those. So for many of them, they would get this one workshop in internal orientation, and then they may not have the opportunity to even try it until second year, and that's, you could be, you know, a year, year and a half later, and then sort of expected to, to sort of remember how to do these skills. And the bedside, skill development from bedside teaching can be very variable in the emergency room. Um, it depends, um, you know, it's not necessarily a, a something that every single resident is going to have the opportunity every single time they rotate through the ER. Depends on what patient comes in, what the patient actually needs, if there's the opportunity. And there are often a number of residents there, and there may be some competition because there may be a limited number of these procedures and, you know, sort of competing with other residents. Someone is not wanting to, you know, it's maybe um, difficult for everyone to sort of get that same experience. So with that in mind, we were sort of trying to get them a uh, opportunity to practice this in a more controlled environment and um, to allow for this frequent practice that they could have. So the, the workshop, um, so we ran five pilot workshops that were held throughout between uh, February and April of 2018. We kind of, we tried to spread them out a little bit so we could try to capture as many residents as possible. Um, the timing of them, we did it in the, uh, in the evening around we said 5 p.m., but most of it started a little bit late, you know, as people are trickling in after clinic, um, to try to give residents the opportunity to practice and also to reach a wide range of residents who were maybe were in the ICU one month, they could maybe come another month. The workshops consisted, they had a, we had, did a short lecture that was sort of an abbreviated version of what we would sometimes give for the noon conference, um, but a little bit more focused and a little um, more streamlined demonstration. Um, directed practice, and then they also got a take-home card that they could use as a reference when they're in the ER, as well as if they wanted to practice at home, they had something to kind of refer back to. Was, they were limited to six residents, um, although I will say none of them were filled, but we limited the sign-up to six residents per workshop to try to get to those smaller groups to allow for that more directed feedback. Um, it was just myself running it, so, you know, if, I'm, if I have a group of 20 people, it's a lot harder to give one-on-one -on -one isolated feedback um, than with a smaller group. Um, and I sort of just arbitrarily chose that number six, but it, like I said, none of them were actually filled, so it didn't actually become an issue. And then there was also a pre and post course knowledge assessment as well as a skills assessment to see did this actually help them improve their skills. So this is the suture card that they got as their take home. So it kind of had a little background on uh, suture choice as well as size of suture and how long to leave it in, anesthetic choice. And then on the back, there was like a sort of a just-in-time reminder of, hey, this is how you actually go through this. Um, and this was a card that was developed by um, Dr. Sanders previously. But we laminated them and had them as sort of little pocket references that they could take home with them. In terms of the assessments of what assessment of the knowledge and the skills, the knowledge assessment, we did a five-question quiz on, on anesthetic and suture selection. We didn't include that as part of the skills themselves because um, we didn't really have the setup to evaluate them choosing like the right anesthetic or the right suture or that sort of thing. And then also including ranking comfort and, and confidence with, with placement of skills, uh, placement of the sutures pre and post workshop. And then the skills assessment, um, we did it as a, we did, developed a 26 point scale that we did as a pass fail with each step of the procedure that of watching them place two simple interrupted sutures onto a practice suture pad. Um, simple interrupted sutures are the sort of most common one that we do, or the, the residents do is sort of the, the standard one that they should all know how to do. Um, we did two as well so we could take a look at spacing. Um, so that's why we chose two. We developed this because there was, uh, and when I looked around, I couldn't really find uh, already validated or already created um, <laughs> skills checklist for this. So we made one ourselves. So the workshops themselves as well. Um, so we had 11 residents participate. They were pretty evenly spaced out uh, between the, the three years, which was kind of nice to get a, a little bit of a variety of, of people in. Um, so it wasn't a huge number. There's like, I think about 55-ish residents. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Plus minus a couple, so you know the, so there was about a, you know about a fifth of them participated. Um, I will say we did sort of sometimes discuss some other knot tying depending on um, resident interest and, and how they were progressing. Um, there was one group that you know got the skills down pretty quickly and they wanted to learn some they wanted to stay and learn some extra ones. So we we did that at the end. Um, so we had kept that as an option. 
in terms of the knowledge assessment. Um, they improved quite a bit for all of them, um, for all of the, uh, the questions. Um, there were still a couple where they still had a little bit of difficulty with the suture selection. Some of that is in their take-home card, which was um, sort of part of the reason we gave them the take-home card as well, because some of that, we don't necessarily expect them to memorize. So that's something that can be easily referenced and looked up. We just wanted them to have a quick, handy reference for where they could find that. Um, but they did all show an improvement on that, that post-test themselves. In terms of the skills themselves, the actual placing of the sutures, there was a significant improvement in their suturing performance before and after the workshop. Um, again, this was a 26-point scale, so initially they were averaging about half of it was they were doing correctly, and then by the end, after post-workshop, almost everyone was um, able to, to place everything with maybe just minor things here and there. I was the one who was evaluating this so I mean there is always that potential for a little unconscious bias on my part but I tried to stay, uh, keep everything as objective as possible um, when I was doing the, the pass fail um, marking on that um, and the residents weren't shown this scale um, before or after so they actually didn't even didn't necessarily see that but we did give them feedback on things that they missed so people um, especially at the post assessment that missed that didn't get a perfect score um, that we did give feedback on on what they missed on that so um, overall, the response to the workshop was very positive. Um, before the test, no one really felt um, confident, strongly confident in placing sutures. Um, and post, um, everyone felt that they were very confident or confident or very confident in being able to place the sutures. And in terms of being able to super, uh, suture without supervision, um, that also increased um, quite a bit. There were still obviously some people who didn't feel comfortable that they could place them without supervision, which I would expect, especially for the interns. Um, I didn't break this down by, by year just because there was sort of too few residents to really look at that, but, um, but they definitely improved in their, in their comfort level with that. Um, the other thing we were assessing was how frequently would people be willing to come to this because it's great to, again, sort of do it once a year, but um, the, you know, the idea would be to have that happen more often so that they could have that opportunity to come more frequently and to sort of see how often would people be willing to come. Um, this actually surprised me. I thought more people would say they would not want to come very often, that they'd want to come like quarterly or something, but actually most people said they would want to come either monthly or every two months um, to some sort of a procedure workshop to, to sort of improve these skills or to practice them again. Um, I will say again, this was a small number, and it may have also it was voluntary, so it may have been a self-selected group as well um, of people who were more interested in that. So, um, so I fully realized that as well. But, um, but that's still um, the anecdotally though, there were more people who were interested in coming, but just with the timing of when um, we held them, um, they were unable to come, or some people got stuck in clinic that were signed up to come actually got stuck in clinic and were unable to attend. So we had a few other people that um, that just uh, because of just scheduling issues and timing um, weren't able to come that wanted to. So. So overall, um, this evaluation um, showed some feasibility and acceptability by the residents of this curriculum and this potential sort of way to, to teach them procedural skills and to reinforce these skills. And all residents showed an improvement in their knowledge and skills at the end of the workshop. Um, you know, the sort of next steps though, um, some of this that we already kind of talked about a little bit with, with Anna's would be, you know, determining the retention of skills and then how frequently do people need to practice this or how, how many times do they need to go over this in order to actually be able to just then go in independently and do it on their own um, and to, to sort of not feel like they need this continual um, refresher course. Um, and then again, translation into actual clinical practice because um, they were practicing on suture pads. So it's very different when you have a two-year-old child who's wiggling around and you're trying to stitch up their forehead. Um, so trying to sort of see how that would actually translate into like, clinical practice um, as well as then the optimal timing of these workshops. Um, you know, is it potentially best to have people refresh these courses right before they um, go into the ER or, you know, doing it, having them do the same one like every two months or every four months, you know, to, to sort of keep those skills up um, so that they don't necessarily have quite as much of a learning curve when they come into the ER. Um, and, then all, and then also, as I mentioned, to sort of expand these to other procedures as well. Um, to, to, you could have, to, the idea was to have like a rotation of them um, going so that, you know, every, maybe every fourth month it would be suturing, but in between you'd have ones for like LPs or, or splinting or other things like that. Um, but to sort of expand that out and, and have it as more um, consistent. Uh, and so that's it. Um, so special thanks uh, again to my mentor, Jenny Sanders, and to uh, Nessie Dahan, who was one of our pediatric residents, who um, sort of helped to encourage his co-residents to, um, to come participate and, and who helped a lot. Um, he came to every one of them and helped me um, with setup and cleanup and all of that stuff. And then as well to the Harvard Macy program for, um, and the, the Medical Education Institute for, for funding me to go to the Harvard Macy program.
contact info or some of my references from before. And that's it. Any questions?